Hello, everyone. Good evening. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming out on a lovely Los Angeles evening. My name is Greg Salyer. I have the best job in the world. I am the president of the Philosophical Research Society. So let me take a moment and tell you where you are and who we are before I introduce our speaker tonight. So in 1934, a man named Manley Palmer Hall uh, founded this society uh, and wanted it to be the the place where seekers could come, people who were looking for wisdom, which is the etymological meaning of the word philosophy, the love of wisdom. Now, he hated academics like me, um, people who study philosophy in theoretical and abstract and inapplicable ways. But we try to do that here still, even though I am an academic. Uh, we love wisdom and we have a value here that is focused on the seeker and her path. And as long as that path is compassionate and open, we're here for you. We've got plenty of resources for you. We've got Manley Hall's amazing library uh, that he founded again in 1934 and uh, 20 some thousand volumes of esoteric and, and other wisdom. Um, he was a rem an amazing speaker lectured all over the world, lectured at Carnegie Hall, and he had an amazing gift of teaching as well. So in 1959, he built this auditorium where you are now and filled it every Sunday. Uh, there are photographs in the bookstore where people are lining the walls, and he asked for a dollar, if you'd give a dollar, on a Sunday morning at 11, and he would speak for 90 minutes straight, flawlessly, no notes, not a hesitation, not an um, as I've already probably done three, uh, flawless. And he would sit in that chair and then he'd say, well, that's about enough. And he'd walk off, no questions. <laughs> this is a different time. But we still uh, continue that mission today. And uh, I'm happy to say uh, we've expanded it even through the use of music and art. We opened an art gallery last year. And uh, we've had, already had two amazing shows in it. Uh, we've, we've got another show coming up in September. We, uh, we have a marvelous bookstore that I hope you saw. And we have the library. And we also have these amazing events, uh, like this special lecture tonight on this terrific artist that uh, I w I'm eager to know more about. Let me say one more thing, invite you to one more thing. Every Tuesday night, I do what's called the President's Class. Uh, I'm the only president of an educational institution who gets to actually teach, so I'm going to take advantage of that. And we have the President's Class that is great fun for me. I think it's fun for the people who come. Uh, I can't get them to leave, so that's probably a good sign. Uh, right now, we're doing a series called Passages, where I just, we just take a passage from world literature or sacred text or philosophy or whatever. And I'll read the passage, I'll provide some context for it, and then we just talk about it. So uh, last night was the amazing mystic Marjorie Kemp, uh, where we got to talk about her ecstatic experiences. Yes, r raise a hand for Marjorie Kemp. I see you back there. Yes. Next week is William Blake. 7 o'clock by donation. Feel free to come and fill the auditorium as you've done tonight. So here's... Uh, our good friend Michael Carter, here's what it says about Michael Carter. He received his MFA from Claremont Graduate University in 2010, and his work is an inquiry into metaphysical theories of art and has been exhibited extensively locally and abroad, including recent exhibitions in Denmark and Romania. He studied Blavatskyan theosophy for more than a decade. Now, Michael is being very humble here. Michael's into all kinds of things, and you should ask him about it at some point. I got to know Michael by visiting his studio downtown and seeing the result of his pendulum paintings. And we were happy to have Michael in our second art show here called Unified Field. And part of that show was what we called a happening. And so we gathered in the courtyard out here at about 8.30. It was just getting dark. 
And I'd had a rough day and traffic was traffic in LA and people are like grumbling coming in. And Michael set up his paint can. We had rigged a thing where he could hang his paint can and there was a black canvas on the ground. And uh, I thought, man, you better not get paint on our courtyard. You know, I'm thinking all these monkey minds thoughts. And 125 Angelinos showed up. And for 45 minutes after Michael started the paint, we sat there in silence and watched the paint dry. It was amazing. And that is the Michael Carter I know. Please welcome Michael Carter. Thank you, Greg. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. I'm very excited to give this lecture. Uh, this is a topic that has been uh, very interesting to me for a number of years. And I realized recently that, uh, at least at this moment in Los Angeles, that I was carrying around in my head more information about this and uh, more details than probably anybody else that I knew. So I felt that was a great opportunity to share this with you uh, and hopefully get you as equally excited about this. So let's begin. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about Hilma of Klint, as you all know, and uh, we'll be talking about the complications of her story and the story that uh, I think circulates in a lot of places right now today. So the first thing I want to kind of address is uh, why me? Like what makes my particular perspective on this different than other people? So you notice the diagram that I have here on the screen. It's kind of broken into these three groups. Um, it's uh, artists right, the kind of uh, academic, and by that I mean like uh, art historians, art writers, curators, uh, other kinds of groups. And then the last group, I've used this word occultist. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the most precise word, but it's probably encompassing the broadest range. So these three groups, they don't necessarily overlap. And I've kind of tried to show that a little bit through the diagram there. Uh, there tends to be a lot of dialogue between the artists and the art historians, the art curators. And there's definite interest in the artists in the spiritual, but it can often be sort of superficial. Uh, equally, too, between the kind of like academic world, looking at uh, the metaphysicians and occultists, it can tend to kind of stop at a certain level and not go much deeper. Then sort of from the spiritual realm of people, uh, there tends to be a kind of a partial engagement with academia, part, partially because there's a lot of rejection there. And also, too, with artists, uh, there's not necessarily like a really deep understanding uh, from people who would consider them spir themselves spiritual with what it is that artists actually do, uh, what their practice are like today. Uh, and so this is what I think makes my particular uh, contribution to this unique, is that I kind of sit at the middle of this diagram. Uh, I'm an academically trained artist, so I'm familiar kind of with what's going on in the scholarship. Uh, I'm a practicing artist, so I know I can talk about this from the perspective of an artist. And also, you know, I've been a student of uh, Blavatsky and theosophy specifically for almost 15 years now. So I know a lot of these um, references and connections that the other two groups we'll just totally miss. So I wanna share this perspective with you tonight and uh, hopefully kind of bring you along on this. So the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna kind of break this talk up into three parts. Uh, first, we're gonna go through kind of a timeline. We're just gonna look at off Clint's life, like you know, birth to death and talk about what happens during that time. Uh, the second thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, we're gonna look at a few of the works in particular and kind of go into them more deeply. And then finally, I wanna to try to reflect on why I think this is important today. So let's get started. Uh, so, uh, Offklin's born in 1862 uh, in Stockholm. Uh, this is a photo of Stockholm from that decade. Uh, she's born into a family of uh, naval captains and mariners, it's a maritime family. Uh, and you can see right there, right, it's a port city, there are the boats. So jumping ahead a little bit to the 1870s, uh, we're now kind of, uh, she's a teenager. Uh, at the age of 17, she joins a, a spiritualist group and begins participating in seances. About a year later or so, 
her um, younger sister dies uh, at age 10. And this kind of really spurs her engagement and her involvement. She becomes more serious in these uh, groups. Within a couple of years, however, she kind of drops out of this. Uh, she kind of feels what the scholarship says that she, is that she feels kind of like that the seances are perhaps not serious enough for her. They're, they're too uh, frivolous on a certain level. Uh, and so at 20, she's basically more or less has left the spiritualist movement of her era. I kind of want to talk just briefly. Some of you will know who these women are. Uh, to kind of give a sense of what's going on in the broader spiritualist movement. Uh, you know, in the 19th century, obviously, some of you will be aware this was a very popular uh, spiritual movement for many people. There were uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people who saw themselves as members worldwide. Uh, so these are the Fox sisters, uh, Margaret on the left and uh, Kate on the right. And they're usually given credit for sort of the spark that starts the Victorian era spiritualist movement. Uh, they were living um, in upstate New York as teenagers, and they reported these um, kind of encounters with uh, knocks or rappings that they were hearing, and eventually claimed that these were coming from contacts with spirits and they could communicate with them. Um, but by the time the 1880s roll around, uh, this happens in the 1840s originally, they're, um, they're kind of not doing as well. Um, they're in their 50s. And um, they've they both been tragically widowed, and, and it's usually said that they're struggling with alcoholism at this point. Um, by the end of the 1880s, around the time when uh, Off Klint is actually entering the spiritualist movement over in Stockholm, uh, back in America, the Fox sisters are actually um, have uh, confessed, or they're, they are, uh, they sign these confessions that are published in papers that basically say, we made this whole thing up. Uh, these, the rackings were fake. Um, we, um, they're not spiritual contact. We, we were able to kind of like trick people. And um, that's, that's really what this was always all about. Um, and for about a year, they actually go on a speaking circuit and they earn money as a debunker of spiritualism. So, however, about a year or two after this happens, both of them recant this confession. Um, and Kate, once again, begins conveying spirit messages to her, quote, friends. Uh, and so there's kind of, they get stuck in the middle. They're uh, not welcome in either group. And um, by the early 1900s, they're actually, or, sorry, by the early 1890s, they're both dead. Uh, they both died quite young. And uh, it's often says that, that they uh, died basically because they drunk themselves to death. So I wanted to sort of point this out because it kind of colors what happens then in Off Clint's life going forward, which we'll get back to in some other points. So her 1880s, back in Stockholm, we're back with Off Clint. Um, she attends the Royal Academy of Fine Arts. She's part of the first generation of women who are able to do this. She graduates the academy there with honors, and she's awarded a studio. Uh, in the center of Stockholm in the arts district there. And this is a very prestigious uh, award at the time. She's able to basically enter into a professional life as an artist. Uh, we know during this period, 1887 to 1905, she's working as a professional artist. Uh, she's a portraiturist, she's a landscape painter. Uh, she makes her living this way. Uh, here she is from this time period, it's about 1885. And if you look in the background of this painting kind of on the wall behind her, you can see there's two studies kind of one up by her head, which seems to have maybe like a road in it. And then there's one lower down by her paintbrushes. It seems like there's um, a tree or something kind of in the background. And these are likely studies for this painting that she did in 1888 called Summer Landscape. So this is a very, uh, of the era, it's a very typical academic painting. Uh, this was a, of the typical style that you would learn if you went to an art academy at this era. So to try to give you some context for what this is like, uh, this is another work from 1888 as well. This is John William Waterhouse's The Lady of Shalott. This is a big painting. Uh, it's maybe five foot by seven foot. And the best way to understand these paintings, the academic paintings in this era, is they're kind of like a, like a big budget studio film. They're, um, they're, they, were, they involve many different people. It's a real production, assistance. Um, they do all kinds of sketches and studies from life. They would have a model come in and they would draw her with costumes. They would find the items. They would figure out every piece of this. They would do studies in color. They would do studies in grayscale. And then finally, they would execute the piece. 
So it was a real, it was a real studio production. Um, also from the same year is this piece by Paul Gauguin. This is a vision after the sermon. This is a much more modest piece. It's about two foot by three foot. Uh, and you can already see this is a very different style of work. Uh, Gauguin is oftentimes connected to several different movements. Sometimes this is considered a symbolist work. It does not depict reality. Uh, you, in, in art history classes, we're usually told that the red is a depiction of a kind of the, another world or psychological state or something like that. So in the foreground, these are um, parishioners who've just been to a sermon and at, coming out of the church, they have this vision of an angel. Uh, in this case, the, the sermon is on um, Jacob wrestling the angel. So you can already start to see that there's, a, there's very different kinds of work being created in this era. So 1889. Uh, this is a year that uh, often becomes a member of the Theosophical Society in Sweden. Uh, she becomes a member the first year that it's founded there. And she'll stay a member for 30 years. And this is her major involvement. Um, the uh, Hilmolf Clint Foundation has this statement on their website about her involvement. And it says, above all, you know, that uh, Off Clint was heavily involved in a theosophical society from which she was a member from the very start. So this is her major kind of spiritual connection and her framework for, I think, a lot of what comes later. One other thing I also want to talk about from this period uh, this is a botanic, botanical drawing that she did uh, from 1890. There's a, a lot of talk sort of in the scholarship about this uh, relationship of the science or the scientific in her work. And uh, people will often try to connect this to her studies in, as an academic artist or uh, sometimes to her, her upbringing in a, a naval family. But I think there's also another really strong reason for this sort of scientific perception. Um, and that actually comes from her spiritual interests. And so this is the title page to the secret doctrine. Uh, and you'll notice there in the subtitle, it says the synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy. And science is first. And even further too, even within the spiritualist movement, right, this, um, um, excuse me, let me get to this quote first. So this is a quote from uh, Blavatsky from Isis Unveiled from the same era. And she says, there is no miracle. Everything that happens is the result of law, eternal, immutable, ever active. Apparent miracle is but the operation of forces antagonistic to the well-ascertained laws of nature. This ignores the fact that there may be laws once known, now unknown to science. So this has really always been a part of um, the sort of theosophical perspective that Blavatsky is uh, communicating. Uh, this uh, scientific approach to spiritualism or this scientific approach to religion. And even in the spiritualist movement, we see this kind of thing. Uh, the BBC even has this little uh, website section where they describe sort of uh, world traditions and religions and contains this particular quote. Many spiritualists teach that spiritualism is, not based, is based on natural scientific laws and does not involve the supernatural. They say that the difference between their faith and other religions is that most religions are based on belief, while spiritualism is based on demonstrated evidence that there is life after death. So we don't even have to go into um, kind of other explanations. This seems to be kind of at the core of her understanding of spirituality of this era. Uh, also from the same period here, 1895, this is her. She's uh, in her early 30s at this point. Uh, this is her, her studio in Stockholm. Uh, another thing that we know that starts to happen in this era as well um, is uh, the uh, secret doctrine, right? Which is sort of the main uh, metaphysical text that Blavatsky writes uh, is fully translated into Swedish at this point. So it starts in 1893, it's published serially. And um, by the end of the 1890s, it's been totally translated into Sweden. Uh, Swedish, this is significant because we know she had a copy of it when we know she had it in Swedish and that she referred to it often and read it and studied it. Uh, so 1896. Um, this is the kind of a period where I think you mostly start to hear a lot of information. You hear most of the kind of details, right? This is when uh, uh, off Clint, she forms a, a group known as called the Five, with uh, five with four others of her um, uh, female friends and other artists. 
and they begin to engage in a kind of uh, regular spiritual practice that includes seances and mediumship and other kinds of work. Uh, here's the altar that they used for this. And one thing you should notice about this altar too is it has Christian iconography. They, uh, they consider themselves a, a Christian spiritualist group the whole time. Uh, so it's got the portrait of Jesus, it's got the cross in the center, it's the Calvary cross on the three steps. So um, I, I'll be quoting regularly from a, in this presentation from an anthroposophical uh, art historian named David Adams. Uh, and uh, he has this to say about this particular moment. In 1896, she formed with four other women the Friday group, or the Five, a Christian spiritualist group that met weekly for the next 10 years in each other's homes and studios for meetings consisting of a prayer, meditation, reciting sermons, study of a text from the New Testament, a benediction, and ending with a seance while kneeling around an altar with a triangle and cross during which they contacted disembodied spirits and spiritual guides. 1891, Blavatsky dies in London. This um, will set off a lot of events that then become, uh, will reflect later on in uh, Offglen's life in terms of her own path. Uh, here she is uh, around 1900, she's 39 or so at this time. We know during this period she's still working professionally as an artist. Uh, for about a year, she works as a draftsman for the Veterinary Institute in Stockholm, doing uh, medical illustrations related to animals. Uh, okay, and so now things sort of start really getting underway. Um, in 1904, she, and during a uh, seance with the five, uh, they receive this message from their spirit guides uh, to, to carry out this monumental commission of artwork. Uh, within the group, um, the other women actually reject this, and Offklint is the one who says, oh, okay, I'll take this on. It seems for all of them to be too, um, too large, perhaps too much of a commission. So over the next year, she spends this time uh, under the spirit of, under the guidance of a particular spirit that they have called Amaliel, uh, and she pre prepares for this commission. She uh, spends a year in, in cleansing and preparation. So here's their, the table where they were doing this, these spirit uh, communications. Uh, and back to Adams again. The five found themselves in regular, repeated contact with a number of named spirits. Teohatius, Amaliel, Clemens, George, Gregor, Esther, and Ananda, two of whom, Amaliel and Ananda, were said to belong to a group of still more advanced spirits than the others served, called Dehoga, the High Ones, or the High Guides, or High Masters. And uh, off Clint describes these, these uh, spirit guides in her own uh, journals like this. The master of mysteries, synonymous with the Vestal ascetic, servants of Christ who reside in Tibet in their astral body, an exalted and holy brotherhood known to all mystics who participate in the evolution of the world. The high masters fill the entire universe. Uh, that's quite a mouthful. Um, so from the same area, it's an example of the kind of drawings that they were doing in the seances, right? This is uh, what happens eventually is initially all of the women uh, take turns in doing uh, the spirit drawings, but eventually uh, off Clint is the only one who does it. So this is one by, just by uh, Hilma. Uh, and here's another one as well from a year later. So I'm going to come back to this one a couple of times because I think that there's several things that are happening in this illustration which uh, will open up into other aspects of her practice later on. So here, note the spiral. And uh, you might be able to see it from where you are, but if not, she writes the word evolution on this one three or four times in the background. So these kinds of things were probably done, right? These uh, illustrations would have been done flat on a table, right? Uh, they might have used something like this, which is uh, like a planchette, but it's wheeled so that multiple, more than one of them could hold it and move it around as the drawing would take place. 1906, so she's got the commission, she needs to start doing this preparatory work. And 1906 is really where the first of these new kind of works happens. So she prates what are preparatory pieces for the paintings of the temple. Uh, during that year, 
she makes this uh, entry in her journal. And she says, Amelia presented me with a task, and I immediately said yes. The expectation was that I would dedicate a year to this task. In the end, it became the greatest work of my life. So um, she gives up the realistic painting that she's been doing professionally during this time period. Uh, she continues with the prayer and fasting cycle that she's been involved with. And um, in November of 1906, she's 43 at this point, she creates 34 preparatory paintings uh, that are called the Group One. So this is that group. This is at the uh, Louisiana Museum of Modern Art in Denmark. And you can see they're all kind of of a similar quality. They're painted with yellows and blues or combinations of them to make green. Uh, they have different kinds of, sometimes these are described as sort of uh, scientific illustrations. So here's one, this is number four from that series. They're all about like 20 by 15 inches. They're pretty small, they're painted directly on the canvas. Um, this is the same work at the Guggenheim. Uh, so you get a sense of what these are like. And see, they're really, they're just painted immediately. There's no preparation. She's just picking up the paint and painting right on the canvas. And this is a totally different kind of practice compared to the academic work that she was doing before. These things are great. They're literally just framed. They're like tacked up inside these frames. I love the tactile quality of these pieces. This is uh, number five from the same series. So uh, going back to David Adams again, he describes this. In the freely painted Primordial Chaos series, she explored principles of polarity, light and dark, good and evil, male and female, and their possible reunification. In these and later works, the letter W represents matter, while the letter U represents spirit, with the WU indicating a union of the dualities. And you can see all of that happening in this particular piece. It's uh, interesting to note in the center where the U appears, there's also a cross. Uh, here's another one from this series. Uh, in her own notebooks, Auckland talks about this uh, era of work and she says, the pictures were painted directly through me without any preliminary drawings and with great force. I had no idea what the paintings were supposed to depict. Nevertheless, I worked swiftly and surely without changing a single brushstroke. So this thing that she points out in this statement where she says, I have no idea what these paintings were supposed to represent, is actually a, a common theme and this will appear again and again. She's often doing these works and she doesn't quite know what she's doing, but she uh, is sort of compelled to work them out. 1907. So this is the kind of a major year, or perhaps the major year of her work. This is when uh, she paints in this year 111 pieces uh, that become the paintings of the temple. Uh, this is when she paints what are the largest works of her entire uh, career, her entire practice, the 10 largest. This is uh, number one, childhood. These works are all very large. They're about 10 and a half feet tall by eight foot wide. Uh, she paints this entire group, this is group four, from May of 1907 to April of 1908. And she spends four days on each one of these pieces, which is kind of mind boggling to me. She's just literally like cranking these things out. Here are the same works installed at the Guggenheim. You can get a sense kind of how big these are. So 1907, like what else is going on in the broader art world at this time? This is the same year that uh, Picasso finishes the Demoiselle de Avignon. Uh, he actually also doesn't show this work immediately, but turns it over and puts it away in his studio because he feels like it's uh, too much at the time. This work is not as big as any of the 10 largest. It's only maybe eight foot by seven. Also very important to this conversation, uh, this is uh, Vasily Kandinsky, uh, The Colorful Life, 1907. This is, this is uh, works about uh, five by six feet or so. So you see, he's, uh, he's never an academically trained artist. He's already kind of working in this kind of looser method at this point, but still definitely representational. Also important for our conversation here is Mondrian. Uh, this is Mondrian's The Red Tree from 1908. Uh, this work is maybe two foot by three foot. So you see he's, he's um, already at this point uh, very much engaged with ideas that he's reading about in uh, theosophy, but it really hasn't uh, permeated into his work yet. 
So just really quickly, I want to go back to the 10 largest. This is number 10, old age. So I think these kinds of uh, photographs, it's really hard to get a sense of what these pieces are really like. Uh, so this is some of my you know, iPhone photos from the Guggenheim again, and you get to get a better sense of what the, the physicality of these pieces. Uh, they're painted on paper in tempera, and then they're glued to canvas. So this texture of them is very uh, wrinkly and rough. They're almost like a leather or a skin on these, these works. This one is really interesting too because this is the old age, it's the last work, but you can see this, this uh, kind of teardrop element on the bottom is sometimes called a seed. And so there's a kind of uh, art historical reading of this that perhaps she's talking about the full cycle, right? At the very end of old age, there's the seed that starts it over again. So it's one other thing that's really interesting about these works to me personally, which is that as art historians and conservators have been looking at them, one of the things that they've discovered about them is that they have footprints on them. And then that's because she worked on all of these pieces on the floor. So she basically, in her studio in Stockholm, she maxed out the floor space that she had and laid out paper on the floor and painted these works with the help of a single assistant on the floor. So you can kind of get a sense of what that was like. This is uh, Matisse working on the Stations of the Cross uh, in the Rosary Chapel. And you can see how he's got this, like it's a bamboo stick and he's got maybe a piece of charcoal on it in the end. And so he's able to work at this at a distance and work on this scale. So uh, off Clint would have been standing above or around these pieces and making these marks with um, this kind of like long, elongated stick. So of course, another example of floor painting, right? Jackson Pollock. This is a great photo by Hans Namath from the 50s of Pollock working on his uh, drip paintings or action paintings. Uh, another example, this is my work, right? So this is the work with the pendulums. Thanks. Uh, same kind of thing, right? It's actually when I developed this process, I had no idea that um, the Offclint had done this as well. Uh, I guess it's something that artists do when you need more space. Same kind of idea, right? So I make these with the pendulum on the floor and then the pa finished painting is hung vertically on the wall. Okay. So 1908, this is a really interesting moment in uh, Offclint's life. Uh, it's a, there's some kind of uh, confusion about exactly what happens in this period. We know that she stops painting. Uh, it's, there's some contention about why she stops painting during this time period. It's kind of is perhaps like a Rorschach test about what you think. Um, we know at the beginning of this era, her mother becomes seriously ill and eventually becomes blind. Uh, and that she gives up her original studio in the center of Stockholm and she moves to a different space. Um, this is also the year, 1908, where she first meets Rudolf Steiner. So there's some um, uncertainty in the record about exactly when this meeting took place or what the content of that meeting was. Um, there, um, the, there, it, it's still not 100% certain. Uh, again, talking, going back to um, uh, Adams, who I discovered before, he actually had the opportunity to go look in the archives at Dornoch and discovered there's actually correspondence there from this time period between Steiner and Offklint. So he has at least been able to confirm this meeting definitely happened. Uh, so some of the first kind of art historical um, information that was written about this meeting goes like this. By chance, Rudolf Steiner general secretary of the Theosophical Association, German section, and founder of the Anthroposophy, visited Hilma Ofklint. Most likely the visit occurred in 1908. He witnessed the entire body of work which had been inspired by his lead, and he expressed himself on the painting. There are only vague notes from this visit, and the exact point in time is not completely established. Steiner observed that he had no possibility to understand the work, but that it could be understandable approximately in 50 years. The other thing that Steiner also objects to, and this is kind of one of the points, is basically that uh, he, he had issues with the fact that the work was created through um, the passive mediumship. So uh, atavistically, passively through mediumship, guided by spirits. And he said, he encouraged her in this time period basically that she should develop uh, her own inner faculties more, own spiritual faculties to a greater degree and rely on those instead of these um, guidances from these spirits. Uh, 
And he felt that this was a more proper way to develop and express spiritual knowledge. So this is um, not a unique view to Steiner. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Blavatsky always was hammering this point home, and in her early writings, she talks about this um, uh, repeatedly over and over again. In many ways, she describes that her effort to develop, to organize a theosophical society partially was to uh, combat this rising uh, tide of uh, spiritualism, this desire to uh, give over to a kind of passive mediumship. And so in Isis Unveiled in 1877, she writes, Mediumship is the opposite of adeptship. The medium is the passive instrument of foreign influences. The adept actively controls himself and all inferior potencies. And she goes on later in the Key to Theosophy in uh, 1889 to describe mediumship even more dramatically. A word now accepted to indicate that abnormal, that abnormal psychophysiological state that leads a person to take the fancies of his imagination, his hallucinations, real or artificial, for realities. No entirely healthy person on the physiological and psychic planes can ever be a medium. That which mediums see, hear, and sense is real but untrue. It is either gathered from the astral plane, so deceptive in its vibrations and suggestions, or from pure hallucinations which have no actual existence but for him who perceives them. So one of the other things that I want to kind of talk about at this moment to, to digress a little bit is um, when we read the first quote here about uh, the meeting with Steiner, it, it discussed uh, his involvement with the Theosophical Society. Uh, I've noticed that many people don't know much about the origin of uh, the sort of Steiner movement and the Anthroposophical Society in, in the world. And so I want to just address that slightly because it ends up having a big impact on Flint's life. So here's Steiner in 1907. And uh, some of you might know who he's seated next to. This is Annie Besant. She becomes the president of the International Theosophical Society, the one that's headquartered in India, in Adyar. Um, and um, in, through the rest of the lecture, when I discuss the different theosophical societies, if I ever say I'm talking about the TS, that's the group that I'm referring to is the Indian-based one. In 1902, Steiner becomes the head of the newly formed section, uh, German section of the TS. In 1904, Besson appoints Steiner to be the outer head of the esoteric section for both Germany and Austria. So he's a, he is, by the time he meets uh, off Clint, he's in a very uh, substantial and powerful position within the Theosophical Society. He's responsible not only for the organization of it uh, in uh, Germany, uh, Central Europe, but also for the metaphysical instruction in it. So one of the things that is really fascinating to me, however, is that uh, there's a schism that develops, and part of that schism actually has to do with the use of art in the TS at the time. So in his biography, or his autobiography, he writes this. In the Theosophical Society, uh, artistic interests were scarcely fostered at all. From a certain point of view, this situation was at that time quite intelligible, but it ought not to have continued if the true sense for the spiritual was to be nurtured. The members of such a society center all their interests at first upon the reality of the spiritual life. In the sense world, man appears to them only in his transitory existence, severed from the spiritual. Art seems to them to have its activity within this severed existence. It seems, therefore, to be apart from the spiritual reality for which they seek. Because this was so in the Theosophical Society, artists did not feel at home there. So this photograph is particularly interesting. And there's a number of details here that I want to point out that become significant over the course of this story. So this is a, a photo from 1907. This is the Congress of the European Federation of the Sections of the Theosophical Society, often called the Munich Congress. And so if you look in the very first row there, uh, two from the left, that's Annie Besant again. And then three more over from her with his uh, hand across his chest is Rudolf Steiner. Uh, the thing that's really interesting about this photo, though, is what's in the background on the walls and beside everyone who's sitting. So if you look above everyone, you'll see that there are these round images uh, on the walls of the painting. 
these are sometimes called tondos. Uh, it's a, basically a painting. Uh, these all have some kind of representational image in them. And then if you look also, you'll see that there are um, pillars painted on the walls, kind of like this room. Uh, and then finally, uh, off to the right and above them, there's, there are statues and sculptures. So Steiner writes about this meeting in his autobiography as well. And he says, a large concert hall, which was to serve for the conference we had, provided with an interior decoration which should reflect in form and color artistically the mood that prevailed in the content of the oral proceedings. Artistic environment and spiritual activity in the room should be a harmonious unit. I put the utmost importance on avoiding the abstract in our stick symbolism and letting the artistic sensation speak. And he goes on to say, a great portion of the old members of the Theosophical Society were inwardly displeased by the innovations offered them at the Munich Congress. But it would have been well to understand, but was it clearly grasped at the time by exceedingly few, was the fact that the anthroposophic current had given something of an entirely different bearing from that of the Theosophical Society up to that time. In this inner bearing, the true reason why the Anthroposophical Society could no longer exist as a part of the Theosophical Society. Um, here's Hilma again, 1910 or so. She's in her late 40s. During this time period, too, Kandinsky publishes what is probably his best known book. This is Concerning Spiritual and Art. Uh, in this uh, book, he uh, liberally discusses Theosophy, Steiner, and he quotes Slavatsky. Uh, in the same time period, Mondrian moves to Paris, where he actually stays in the headquarters of the Theosophical Society in Paris, and he lodges there for a while while he's sort of figuring his way out. He paints this painting called Evolution. Uh, it's three foot by maybe five foot or so. And again, this is uh, similar to the Primordial Chaos series of uh, off Glintz we looked at earlier on, uh, showing a sort of a synthesis or reunification of spirit and matter. During this time period as well, Kandinsky paints what's considered his first abstract artwork. This is called First Abstract Watercolor. It's typically dated to 1910. However, scholarship has bumped this up to 1913 recently, which is uh, an interesting note. The dating of the painting is actually 1910, but that's uh, basically been put into, um, has been contested. So 1913, 1915. Um, this is also a very interesting time period as well. Uh, we know that uh, Offklint participates in the World Congress of the Theosophical Society in Stockholm. In 1914, uh, we know that she exhibits her naturalistic paintings at the Baltic exhibition in Malmo. And also in that same exhibition, Kandinsky uh, shows some of his abstract works. This is from that exhibition. Those are Kandinsky's works on the walls. Uh, this is the catalog register from that same exhibition. You can see uh, Hilma's names up there on the top left uh, with the one work that she displayed. And uh, lower on the right side is Kandinsky's name as well. Also during this time period, 1915, this is when she completes the altarpiece series. Uh, it, between 1912 and 1915, she completes an additional 82 works and concludes them with this series. These are the three pieces as displayed in the Guggenheim. We'll come back to this series uh, towards the end. So something else really interesting happens in 1913 as well. Uh, this is from a page of the general report of the 38th anniversary and convention of the Theosophical Society in Adyar from 1914. And if you can see the text, what it says is that um, under Rule 44, the charters of the German sections have lapsed. So what's going on here? So this is what's going on. Some of you might know who this is already. Yeah, or you might recognize him when he's slightly older. This is Jiddu Krishnamurti. So Krishnamurti plays a very interesting role in this whole story. Uh, if you've ever been to Ojai, you've been in the sort of northwestern edge of town, is the Krishnamurti Society of America, same person. 
Here he is uh, in the 1920s lecturing there at the Oak Grove in Ojai. So what is this all about? Well, uh, many times in her writings, uh, Blavatsky makes what is kind of a claim or perhaps even a prophecy. And she says the following. In century the 20th, some disciple more informed and far better fitted may be sent by the masters of wisdom to give final and irrefutable proofs that there exists a science called the Gupta Vidya or the secret wisdom. And she repeats this claim many times. She basically says, in the 20th century, there will be another spiritual teacher, a major spiritual teacher. It helps to kind of understand the arc of her major works, Blavatsky's, to understand a little bit more of this. So Isis Unveiled, 1877. The idea here is that basically we're clearing away misconceptions. These are um, uh, un misunderstandings in both science and the religion of her era. In 1888, or probably what is considered her most substantial work, The Seeker Doctrine. So now we've cleared away the underbrush. Uh, now we can talk about new concepts and terminologies. But that uh, is not all that happens in 1888. What also happens is the esoteric section of the Theosophical Society is organized. And so the idea here is for the uh, student of theosophy who, uh, is, who has mastered the other two material, now this is a way to implement this in your life. Um, this is now the development of those concepts and a way to do it in practice. And in that material, she makes the following statement. Those who will not have profited by the opportunity given to the world in every last quarter of the century those who will not have reached a certain point of psychic and spiritual development, or that point from which begins the cycle of adeptship, by that day, those will advance no further than knowledge already acquired. No master of wisdom from the East will himself appear or send anyone to Europe or America after that period, and the sluggards will have to renounce their chance of advancement in their present incarnations until the year 1975. She's very specific about this. So this sets off a whole lot of conversations within the Theosophical Society of her era, including this uh, article, which is titled, Will the Master's Help Be Withdrawn in 1898 Until 1975? And if you know anything about the broader sweep of the uh, spiritual movements in the West and America, the 1970s is a major moment for this, especially 1975. Uh, pretty much, I think, uh, the majority of the, the, ver the variation and growth of different kinds of spiritual movements that happen related to the New Age, many of them come from this uh, prophecy or its failure to be realized or its realization, depending on how you think about it. So going back to India and Adyar, this is Charles Ledbetter. He uh, is, a, um, depending on who you talk to, can be considered a controversial figure within the Theosophical Society. And uh, one day on the beach, um, um, on the, along the river in Adyar, he sees this uh, young boy and he says, that's, that's the spiritual teacher. That's the world teacher. That's him right there. That's Krishnamurti. And there he is in 1910 with his brother uh, Nitya. So uh, the, theosophi the TS basically takes this idea and runs with it. Um, in 1907, uh, Annie Besant becomes the president of the Theosophical Society. And uh, through some process that I've never been totally clear about, she says, actually, this is going to happen much sooner. We're going to accelerate this whole timeline. Um, and in 1911, she forms what's called the Order of the Star in the East. And here's the, the statement she makes for that. This order has been founded to draw together those who, whether inside or outside the Theosophical Society, believe in the near coming of a great spiritual teacher for the helping of the world. And that's exactly what they do. So there's Krishnamurti as the world teacher. This painting is actually hanging today in the headquarters of the Theosophical Society in America up in Wheaton. Um, I just saw it uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and it, this gets so large that when uh, Krishnamurti visits uh, Los Angeles in the early 20s, he speaks at the Hollywood Bowl and he speaks to 16,000 people. So uh, back in Europe, uh, this situation becomes uh, untenable for the theosophists that are aligned with Steiner. For a number of reasons, uh, they uh, don't agree with this idea at all. And uh, in 1913, after basically uh, coming out being more and more critical publicly about this, Steiner leads a succession of the European theosophists that are aligned with him. 
And uh, it's this um, group of succeeding theosophists. They're primarily uh, Central and Western European. There are several thousand of them in number. Uh, that group becomes the nucleus of what we think of today as the Anthroposophical Society. And you can see that this is the general register again. Uh, the third column is the date of the charter. And you'll see they're all 1912, 1913. That's because the entire German section, all of the German lodges seceded with Steiner. 1914, World War I breaks out. Okay, so back to Hilma. 1916, uh, there's a major shift in her work. She's done with the temple, the paintings for the temple. Uh, the, it's the, the scholarship basically says that we think the shift happens because she comes under this greater influence of the Steiner's approach. And what she does instead is she begins to develop an esoteric systemization of nature. So this is uh, from series one of Violet Blossoms with Guidelines. It's about 20 by 10 inches. And so she compares her earlier botanical illustrations with uh, these uh, charts and references that connect to uh, the inner qualities of these plants that she's documenting. Also in 1920, uh, her mother finally passes away. And she joins then the, what is the newly formed Anthroposophical Society. Here's our uh, local chapter in Pasadena. She also begins traveling now to what is the center of the Anthroposophical Society uh, in Dornach in uh, Switzerland. So going back to Adams, he says, when her mother died in 1920, Offklint felt freer to travel and in September began to undertake regular journeys to Dornach. Over eight or nine separate visits from 1920 to 1925, she spent altogether more than a year there with the longest single visit lasting six months. Uh, this is the first Scotianum. It does not exist today. It was finished in 1923, and it was destroyed the same month it was finished. Uh, the uh, assumption has always been by arson. Uh, during this time period, so she's, she engages in these sort of more systemization works. This is uh, from series two, and these are basically attempts for her to articulate the perspective of different world spiritual traditions through abstract forms. So this one is called number 20, the current standpoint of the Mahatmas. And these are also pretty small. They're about 14 by 10. This is the time too. This is, so she's continuing this. She's doing these sort of um, um, botanical illustrations combined with kind of like esoteric documentation. And she makes this large um, collection of these works and basically ends up at the end with two notebooks that are about 300 pages. And um, she donates these to the natural science selection at the Gothianum, and they're still there today. So this is another kind of quiet period for Hilma, 1921. She's going back and forth to Dornoch to study recently. And at some point, it seems like she stops making work around 1925 to 1930. There's nothing that are dated from those era. There's some conjecture that what happened is that basically she had encountered some of Steiner's earlier lectures regarding um, the, the sort of original sins of visual art, which was copying or merely imitating an appearance of the physical senses or right, the attempt to represent the supersensible. And if you realize what she's basically been doing up to that point is both of those things. So she seems to kind of uh, chill on her own work for a moment. 1921 as well. So Mondrian, this is when Mondrian finally uh, sort of realizes what we think of as his mature style. This is probably one of the first works from that series, Tableau One. He's in Paris again. This is uh, about two by three feet. So there's another strong shift in Hilma's work. She starts doing uh, what basically are known as her late watercolors. If you're familiar at all with the kind of art that is produced uh, with the Waldorf schools today, you should recognize that this is a, a standard style from that. Adams believes that she's even looking at um, examples that come from a uh, Texas Steiner produced called How to Know the Higher Worlds. In that, uh, it has a number of meditations or practices that are designed to cultivate spiritual capabilities. And she seems to actually be referring to those while she's making these paintings. 1923, this is um, Kandinsky's Composition 8. So this is also now the moment when Kandinsky seems to uh, reach also his mature style. In 1925, March 30th, Steiner dies. He's 64. In 1928, 
the second gotihanam is completed. You'll notice it's poured concrete, fireproof. <laughs> And it has this very beautiful auditorium in it in the anthroposophical style. So if you remember all the way back to that Munich Congress in 1907, right? This is the full realization of that kind of uh, vision for an auditorium for a spiritual dialogue. So one thing has come out that's been very interesting. Oftentimes it's said that uh, Offklint never exhibited her spiritual work during her lifetime. And some scholarship was discovered recently that this is actually not correct. We know there was at least one situation where she displayed some of these works while she was alive, uh, including the paintings of the temple. So what happened was uh, in London in 1928, there was a World Congress for Spiritual Science and its Practical Applications. And it was a conference basically designed by the Anthroposophical Society in London as a way to introduce the work of the different sections to the public. And so we know uh, Hilma was given a whole room and she showed a whole bunch of her spiritual works there and actually did a, a lecture as well uh, on July 25th of that year. So jumping back to the Theosophical Society, remember they're on their world teacher kick right now. And in um, 1929, what happens is Krishnamurti rejects this mantle. He basically says, I'm not that person. And uh, he dissolves the order of the star that's been built around him. He withdraws to Ojai, where he continues to live for the rest of his life between traveling and lecturing. This is uh, from a film made of him from the 1930s, uh, again in the Oak Grove in Ojai, where he's giving the speech that dissolved the order. It's usually called uh, Truth is a Pathless Land, and I want to read just a little bit of it. Truth being limitless, unconditioned, unapproachable by any path whatsoever, cannot be organized nor should any organization be formed to lead or to coerce people along any particular path. If you first understand that, then you will see how impossible it is to organize a belief. I have now decided to disband the order of the star as I happen to be its head. You can form other organizations and expect someone else. With that, I am not concerned, nor with creating new cages, new decorations for those cages, my only concern is to set man absolutely, unconditionally free. So this is a moment that actually I think is a major blow to the TS and one that I'm not sure they've totally ever recovered from. 1930, uh, in her notebooks at this point, uh, off Clint um, was basically uh, makes a note there and she says that uh, she's resolving never to travel to Dornock again. In the wake of Steiner's death, there's too much infighting that she's experiencing now in the Anthroposophical Society as well. And uh, she says, uh, this is not for me either. This is a work from 1931 of hers, uh, an untitled work. It's another small work. It's about 9 by 11. Now, at the end of the decade, uh, World War II breaks out. So this is one of the uh, final series of works that uh, Offclint produces. This is uh, an untitled watercolor from 1941. It's about 19 by 12 inches. And you can see it still has many of the features of the earlier work, especially the spirals. Okay, 1944. This is where the timeline ends. Uh, now in New York, Mondrian dies on February 2nd, 1944. In October of that year, uh, Offclint writes what will be the last entry in her journal and ends it with this sentence. You have a mystery service ahead of you and will soon enough realize what is expected of you. On October 21st, um, in the aftermath of a tragic accident, she eventually dies from injuries that she sustains. She's almost 82 years old. Uh, this is, uh, she's not 82 in this photo, she's a little younger. Um, but um, when, when she passes away, she leaves behind approximately 1,300 paintings, 125 note and sketchbooks with approximately 26,000 pages, which according to her will, the works will never be shown or will not be shown for at least 20 years after her death and that none of them should ever be sold. Ending out that year on December 13th, Kandinsky dies in southern France. 
after World War II, um, the uh, Ofklund's work is moved to an anthroposophical colony in Jarna in Sweden. This is that colony today. It still exists. This is the culture house there. They're safely stored away by um, Arne Klingborg, who is the president of the Swedish Anthroposophical Society at this time. Uh, it also has a very beautiful auditorium in the anthroposophical style. So there's a, a lot of very interesting things, things that happen now after her death into the present moment. Uh, but I'm going to jump ahead to the present and sort of discuss what's been happening recently. So there's all these great memes that have shown up. Um, she got a cover of Vogue, Paris. Maybe you guys would like some merchandise. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I've noticed that in, in talking to people sometimes there's this perception that this Guggenheim ex exhibition kind of appeared out of nowhere. It's like, oh, she got this exhibition in Guggenheim. Awesome. It just comes out of nowhere. But that's not the case at all. It's actually the result of a, of a very long process that, interestingly enough, starts here in Los Angeles. The very first place that Ofklund's work is shown after her death internationally is here in LA at this exhibition in 1985 called The Spiritual and Art Abstract Painting 1890 to 1985. Her work is actually becomes a kind of a center point to this exhibition. If you know me, uh, you know that I've told you about this exhibition. And if you don't have this catalog, I've told you to buy a copy of it because I still think it's an incredibly important exhibition. And um, the catalog is amazing. It's still, uh, it, was in, it was in print for years and years and you can still get it fairly inexpensively. It has, uh, even though it's 30 years old at this point, it still has some of the best kind of compilation of this, um, this history of the spiritual influence on modern art. The other thing that's really interesting about this exhibition is it was the exhibition that opened what was called the Anderson Building at the LACMA campus. So if you've ever been along Wilshire and you've seen this building, this is the Anderson Building. It's called the Art of the Americas today. This is one of the buildings that's going to be torn down really soon. Uh, so I don't know, there's some kind of full circle thing happening here. And here's some photos from the exhibition. Mondrian in the front and there's off Clint in the back. There's the altarpiece painting. Here it's paired with Duchamp. This is probably the first didactic wall text ever written for Hilma of Clint. Uh, and it has the standard story that I think most people are familiar with today. This exhibition is really interesting for another reason. This is the center of that exhibition, the center room. So they had this kind of like a yellow painted room that was a hub. And then they divided the works into these themes that were based on um, kind of ideas that were commonly seen in spiritual art. And you notice that this room has vitrines in it, right? And in these vitrines, there's books. So the exhibition had in every room vitrines with books, paired with the paintings. And here's the, the Hilma room. And you can see there off on the left, right? So that's one of her sketchbooks. That's actually one of the, the one on the left there down below is her mediumistic drawings. Uh, below that in the center is what is known as one of the blue books where she documented all of her works, uh, sort of for a future understanding. So what they did for this exhibition that was really, uh, I think, a very important step and one that I haven't seen repeated so far is they really tried to pair the sources with the work so they were basically were making this argument that up to this point had sort of had been marginalized, and I'll talk about this towards the end more, that uh, these artists were involved in these spiritual movements and they were reading these texts and that these texts were directly responsible for the works that they were making. So does anyone have any guess where these texts came from? Right here. Yeah. So you can see in this um, photograph there in the center, that's actually um, a book that's in the collection of the PRS. That's a hand transcribed and hand illuminated version of the esoteric instructions of Blavatsky. Uh, it's in the library here. 
So uh, this is the first time her work is shown internationally, and this catalog is incredibly important to sort of uh, ex share knowledge of her work to many people since then. But between then and now, she's had uh, an incredible exhibition career for someone who's dead. So if you go to the website of the Opklin Foundation, they have a list of all her exhibitions, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pages long. So this, would, these primarily have been in Europe, or they've been international. Uh, these, the works have been circulated extensively. So the Guggenheim exhibition, which sort of was such a breakthrough, I think, in America, is really the result of this long process. It's kind of a coming home. And, uh, and you know, for at least us over here, is bringing to a greater awareness something that's been going on elsewhere. Okay, so that's the kind of recently. And the next thing I want to really talk about is I want to kind of look at some of the works more specifically. Because I think that this is the really interesting point and the thing that I can most share with you all. Um, there's a lot of conversation about what the influences are in her work, especially among art writers, uh, curators, art historians, and the like. And because most of them have very little knowledge of the metaphysical doctrines that she was interested in or involved, they completely miss that particular influence. They just don't know that it's there. And they try to come up with other explanations of what's going on. So going back to these very early works, 1904, the spiral, the word evolution. Right? She does a whole series based on this. This is called, uh, this is group six, Evolution, 1908. A seven from the same series. So I would like to argue that this pairing of the spiral and the evolution is a uh, obviously theosophical influence, obviously comes directly from Blavatsky's writings. So uh, Christine Bergen, who edited a recent text called Hilma Ofklin's Notes and Methods, which is a publication or a republication of her uh, notebooks, has this to say about the use of evolution in her works. It is important to note that for Hilma Ofklin, evolution is not used in the Darwinian sense, but refers instead to spiritual evolution. Both the Theosophists and Rudolf Steiner believe that humans were once pure spirit, but they had been separated from the their spiritual selves by the material world. Evolution for Steiner and Ofklint is the process that will ultimately lead to the re-spiritualization of humankind. So if we go into Blavatsky's writings, uh, Secret Doctrine, right away we find these kinds of images. So one of the things I also want to point out about this image right now is what is a definitely a controversial aspect of the Blavatsky's writings, which is the worst use of the word race. And I think it's easy to help, sort of helpful to understand what she's maybe talking about if um, we think about the places where you see race in the secret doctrine spelled either all uppercase or with an uppercase R. She's basically referring to the human race collectively at a particular period in time and not ethnicity, which is how we typically use the word today. So going on, Blavatsky says this kind of thing a lot. This tracing of spiral lines refers to the evolution of man's as well as nature's principles, an evolution which takes place gradually, as does everything else in nature. Only in relatively recent geological periods has the spiral course of cyclical law swept mankind into the lowest grade of physical evolution, the plane of gross material causation. Were there no such thing as evolutionary cycles, an eternal spiral progress into matter through proportionate obscuration of spirit, though the two are one, followed by an inverse ascent into spirit and then defeat of matter, active and passive by turn. So if we know that uh, Ofklin is looking at these texts, uh, she's using this word evolution in this particular way, she's pairing with use of spiral. For me, it's very hard to separate that from the theosophical doctrines. It seems to be a direct source. But there's another source that I also would like to discuss in this time period that's very interesting. So again, here's the 10 largest. This is number three, youth. And that's this work. This is from 1868. This is titled, Glory Be to God. This is the work of Georgiana Houghton, 
Uh, Houghton lived from 1814 to about 1884, and uh, she was also an academically trained artist. And she was a prominent figure in the early spiritualist movement in Victorian England. During the 1880s, uh, sorry, 1860s and 1870s, she produced what is probably an unprecedented series of abstract watercolor works as part of her practice as a spirit medium, and she called these spirit drawings. This is the Eye of God from 1862. The Eye of the Lord, 1870. And on the back of these paintings, they're pretty small. They're um, maybe 12 by nine or so. She would record what uh, she had received as a medium. She would make notes and information about which particular spirits she had been in contact during uh, the trance. And you can see some of these get, they get very poetical, but they have the same also, the botanical, the natural feeling, the use of curves and spirals that we see from Offlin's work from the same period. Houghton actually went so far as to organize, self-organize an exhibition of her works in London in 1871. Uh, she rented a gallery, she tried to sell them, no one would buy them. Um, she continued to make them after this time period, but she stopped trying to popularize them uh, publicly. So today, less than 50 of these works are known to exist. But I think the thing that's interesting to me about this mostly, though, is this idea of uh, spirit drawings or art made through spirit contact. Uh, this text, this is a, a um, account, right? It's a story about this uh, uh, individual named William Wilkinson who talks about his experience with spiritual art. And he uses the word spirit drawings, but in 1858. Uh, and even by the 1883, this was a popular enough idea that there were uh, magazines being circulated about this. They tended to have representational work, but it's the same kind of thing. So anyways, this is a, a detail right from the 10 largest and then from Houghton's work on the right. So to me, this is really interesting, not because this idea that maybe off Clint saw this work or she copied the work or something like that, but the possibility that there's like an aesthetic for spiritual art, that somehow these people are operating independently uh, and they're uh, unconnected, they, they, they're not uh, in contact with each other, but they're coming up with the same kinds of aesthetic and formal decisions based on these experiences that they're having. And that's really interesting because in terms of the art scholarship and art history, that's a totally unknown moment. There's no information about this at all. And this, again, while this even predates this idea that Off Clint is a pioneer of abstraction or events abstraction in the Western tradition, it's clearly been going on long before this. Okay, so the next one this I want to go into is the Altarpiece series. So Offlin thought these were very important works. They were the kind of summation of the pinnacle of the paintings for the temple. And in her notebooks, she describes them this way, as a summary of the whole work. This is altarpiece one. And uh, so look at some of the details here, right? Uh, this sort of gold, it's actually gold leaf in the center there, the disc. It's got this blue line around the outside. Uh, it's uh, these seven uh, rays of a spectrum, right, that all descend from that center point. Um, it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And it comes from this kind of uh, black and gold point in the center. And this was done in 1915. So this is an illustration from the Harmon manuscript, which is in the collection of the Philosophical Research Library here. Uh, the exact dating of this one is kind of unknown. Uh, we know that um, this text was, the manuscript was started sometime in 1891 and finished sometime in the 19 teens. So it's either before or happening simultaneously with Offlin's work. Uh, so Harmon was an early associate of Manley Hall and he uh, was in contact with Hall in the early days uh, when Hall was a preacher and uh, speaking in downtown LA. So the, this is uh, from the All-Seeing Eye from 1926, and uh, this is an article that Harmon contributed to it. Uh, in general, it is a kind of, it's kind of a recent rediscovery here of this text and, and Harmon in general. Uh, there's some thought that he's living in the East Coast, Philadelphia, Boston, somewhere like that. Uh, and he pops that he was an optometrist. But he made this incredible uh, hand-illustrated, hand-drawn manuscript. And it's filled with these kind of illustrations. So 
So what I think is going on here, and much as I'm open to the idea of a collective unconsciousness or an astral prototype or some other kind of explanation, I suspect that there's probably a more mundane reason for this and that there is some common source that both of these people, uh, off Clint in Sweden, Harmon in America, that both were involved in a Theosophical Society, that they were looking at some common source to make these works. Probably it's a pamphlet or a diagram or something like that printed around 1910. And the, part of the reason I suspect for this is because I know a lot of Harmon's other sources. So here's another one. On the left, this is a diagram from the esoteric instructions. On the right is Harmon's variation of that. Uh, on the left, this is John Worrell Keeley, Chart of Harmonic Evolutions. Uh, Keeley was an American inventor and he uh, was based in Philadelphia. He, uh, uh, Blavatsky actually discusses Keeley's work in The Secret Doctrine. And on the right, that's Harmon's version. It's an identical recreation of the same diagram. So um, what's going on? I wanna go a little deeper for a moment into the Altarpiece One series, because I also wanna connect this back to some particular theosophical concepts uh, that I think are happening from this time period. So I had the opportunity a few weeks ago to go up to Chicago and I went to the uh, national headquarters of the Theosophical Society in America. I was able to spend some time in their library and their archives looking for texts. So you remember we were looking at the rainbow before, this idea of these seven rays. And this is a very popular concept. It's a uh, kind of key uh, occult doctrine that surfaces uh, definitely with Blavatsky, but possibly much, much earlier. So I was able to look at this pamphlet there. It's also from about 1910. Um, and it has, in the back, it has this great note in the front. It says, uh, the fourth creative hierarchy with colored diagrams. And in the back is this diagram. So it's not quite there exactly, but I think that there is, I'm kind of getting close to what is probably a source. So let's go back and look at Harmon's manuscript. Helpfully for us, he's labeled this part of his manuscript. And I don't know if you guys can read those from there, but he basically uh, starts from the right and each one is labeled according to different qualities. So uh, the orange, for instance, Yeah, I actually can't read it on the screen here, it's too small. Let's go to the green one, which is like the animal or natural soul, right? The yellow says it is the aggregate of Dihan Chohak intelligences, right? Uh, the blue says it is the synthesis of occult um, nature. The, the indigo is divine ideation. So you might start to recognize some of these associations with color. These are the very particular, very typical color correspondences that you, you often hear, right? So we talk about these in terms of color healing, color magic, color psychology, those kinds of things. And the claim is that these correspondences are thousands and thousands of years old, that they uh, come from Pythagorean teachings. So we know that Harmon was an associate of Hall's. And if we go to the secret teachings of all ages, there's literally an entire chapter on this called the Pythagorean theory of music and color. And this is the illustration from the front of it. Notice the rainbow. Notice also the rays coming from the mouth of the figure. So if we go deeper into that chapter at the very end, we get this paragraph. This is the final paragraph in the chapter. And it basically is Hall saying, Blavatsky talks about this in the secret doctrine and he gives the color correspondences that are identical or similar to the ones that Harman is using. Here he's um, using both the Sanskrit terminology for these things and uh, also a translation for them. So you remember before when I was talking about green, he talks about lower green, green being the animal soul or indigo being the spiritual intelligence. So these correspond to what uh, Harman wrote on his diagram. And then at the very end of this section, right, at the very end of this paragraph, where he's now connecting it to the planets and the, um, what are these called, uh, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, right? He says at the very end, see the ES instructions. And these are, of course, the esoteric instructions again. So if we go into the second one of these instructions, we get this chart. And this is basically the chart that is identical to Harman's work that we saw earlier, except turned on its side. So it's the same colors, 
with the same associations and like Harmon's illustration is a, is a hierarchy of seven that's broken down into seven sub, sub hierarchies as well. So to get a, I want to go a little digress a little bit and go a little farther here with this one because I think this brings up a really interesting point. Um, and to get a little farther with that, we need to look at this phrase, which is Dihan Chohan. And this is a phrase that shows up often in Blavatsky's writings, especially in The Secret Doctrine. It turns out to be a little controversial. Uh, it's not, um, if you try to translate this from Sanskrit, it, um, you will get stuck on trying to do that. The first word is really easy, which is Dion. So these are what was known for many years as the Dhyani Buddha. And you'll notice, although there are five of them, they all have different colors. Now, uh, we typically talk about these as the uh, Tathagatas. And these are um, uh, meditating or contemplating Buddhas. And the way that we should understand these is, they are not historical figures like Gautama Buddha, but transcendent beings who symbolize universal divine principles or forces. The Dhyani Buddhas represent various aspects of the enlightened consciousness and are great healers of the mind and soul. So the second word from that phrase before, Dhyan Chon, is a little more complicated. If you look it up in a Sanskrit dictionary, you won't find that phrase anywhere. If you try to look that up in Tibetan, you also will not find that phrase. So I like the idea that this phrase is perhaps a slightly corrupted transliteration of this word, which is chos skyong. Vatsi translates chohan as a chief or lord, but this word translates from Tibetan into Sanskrit into dharmapala. So a dharmapala is a protector of the Buddhist dharma. They are typically divinities, usually depicted with wrathful iconography in the Mahayana and tantric traditions of Buddhism. Though benevolent, they are represented as hideous and ferocious in order to instill terror in evil spirits. Their wrath depicts their believed willingness to defend and guard Buddhist followers from dangers and enemies. So this is uh, Mahakala, uh, the supreme time. There's actually right over on the wall here is a thangka of one of the Dharmapalas. So to continue with this idea, right, Bavatsky says in The Secret Doctrine, the seven wise ones, rays of wisdom, dhyanis, fashion seven paths or lines, also races in another sense. To one of these may be distressed, to one of these may the distressed mortal come, which is interpreted solely from the astronomical and cosmic aspect is one of the most pregnant in occult meaning. The paths may mean lines, mariada, but they, they are primarily beams of light falling on the paths leading to wisdom. It means ways or paths. They are in short, the seven rays which fall free from the macrocosmic center, the seven principles in the metaphysical, the seven races in the physical sense. It all depends on the key used. And she goes on, limiting the teaching strictly to this, our earth, it may be shown that as the ethereal forms of the first men are first projected on seven zones by seven Dian Chohanic centers of force. So there are centers of creative power for every root or parent species of host of forms of vegetable and animal life. This again, this is again, no special creation, nor is there any design except in the general ground plan worked out by universal law. But there are certainly designers, though these are neither omnipotent nor omniscient in the absolute sense of the term. They are simply builders or masons, working under the impulse given them by the ever to be unknown on our plane, master mason, the one life and law. So I think that this gives us a sense of maybe what uh, Offland is intending in these altar piece pieces, right? So if we go back and look at this is altar piece two, right? We can see she's using these rays as a kind of a starting point in these pieces. Everything emanates either from or out of these rays, the spiral, the rainbow colors are all used again and again. This is the third one, right? And again, seven rays, the use of colors again. So we sort of can understand these as to mean uh, these are depictions of kind of primordial forces that develop the material universe. However, there's an interesting point that connects all this that I wanna go down for a second. 
which is, uh, Lubatsky is very clear about how we shouldn't understand this idea. And she says, the Ahi, the Han Chohans, are the collective hosts of spiritual beings who are the vehicle for the manifestation of the divine or universal thought and will. They are the intelligent forces that give to and enact in nature her laws, while themselves acting according to laws imposed upon them in a similar manner by still higher powers. But they are not the personifications of the powers of nature as erroneously thought. So after Babatsky's death, this idea actually gets developed quite a lot. So you might have remembered this gentleman from earlier before, Charles Ledbetter, and he takes this idea quite far. In the 20s, he writes a book called The Masters in the Path. And in the second edition, he includes this diagram. So I want to go into what is described as a sixth level in this one, right? There is that word, Chohan. And you'll see now he's listed these seven rays again, but now they all have names. So the outside two, the one of the two here, these are the names of Blavatsky's teachers. The sixth one you probably recognize is Jesus, right? The seventh one is the Count, the Count Saint Germain. And the fourth, fifth, and the third are also different masters, uh, different spiritual teachers. And this is from the the uh, chapter in that book called Chohans and the Rays. So these things are now are fully personified. Here's a diagram of the same uh, thing now with colors and pictures of these rays now as people. It's very interesting if you follow this word Chohan because it seems to not be a word that actually exists in any other language. You can follow it through the changing groups in the, new, in the Western New Age movement and you'll see it come up again and again. So when it leaves the Theosophical Society, uh, intersects with these individuals. This is Guy and Edna Ballard in, uh, sometime around the 1930s. So uh, Guy Ballard there on the left, uh, he is um, up on Mount Shasta in the 1930s, and he claims that he has an encounter with the, Saint, with, uh, the Count of St. Germain. Uh, and he then moves on with his wife to create what is now known as the I Am, or the I am movement, or the I am activity, the full early name, I am the activity of Saint Germain. So if you think the word Chohan means Lord, and we're talking about these rays, and there's seven rays, these are the lords of the seven rays. You probably have seen these images, or if you haven't seen these images, you're probably more familiar with the name that these are known by more regularly now. These are the Ascended Masters. So you can take and do with that of what you will. But I want to go back to Blavatsky again, who I think is very clear about how we should understand this idea in the first place. And she says, these abstractions must be necessity, must of necessity be postulated as the cause of the material universe, which presents itself to the senses and intellect, and they underlie the secondary and subordinate powers of nature, which anthropomorphized have been worshiped as God and gods by the common herd of every age. Okay, so let's look at one more piece of work here. So this is the Swan series. These are all from about 1915. These are all like six foot by six foot. Uh, so notice here the colors used, especially the beaks and the feet. If you've seen other works in this series, you may not realize this is a series because it changes very quickly. So now it's this uh, polarity or these opposites and there's a kind of a churning. This is the 10th from this series. And you can see the same colors are still being used. Here's part of the whole series installed um, at the Moderna Musée. Unfortunately, this is not an order. Uh, the one on the far right is early. The ones in the middle are actually the later ones. This is the end of that series. This is number 23 from the Swan. So I think we can start to understand this um, by actually looking in the Indian tradition in the Vedas. Some of you recognize this as the Trimurti, right? These are the three deities that are conceived to be in charge of creation. Uh, on the left is Brahma as the creator, uh, the center is Shiva the destroyer, and on the right is Vishnu the preserver. If you've ever seen images of Hindu deities, you'll probably notice they often are accompanied with an animal. Uh, this is Ganesh, right, with uh, the rat Mushika. 
And the rat, the animal is called a vahan. It's a vehicle. It has a, like a metaphorical or symbolic quality that uh, complements the deity's uh, powers or potencies. So here is Brahma with his vahan, which is the swan. So uh, Brahma has a complement. His polarity is the goddess Sarasvati. She also has a swan. This swan in Sanskrit is called Hansa. This is the emblem of the Ramakrishna order. If some of you are familiar with the Vedanta Society here in Los Angeles, the um, founder of the Vedanta Society, he belonged to this order. And there is the swan once again. Some of you probably know who this is as well. So uh, if you look at the, t the title here, underneath Autobiography Yogi, it says who it's by, which is Paramahansa Yogananda. So that first word, Paramahansa, is an honorific. It means the supreme swan. So Yogananda helps us understand what this means. The swan is equally at home on land and on water. Similarly, the true sage is equally at home in the realms of matter and of spirit. To be in divine ecstasy and simultaneously to be actively wakeful is the Paramahansa state. The royal swan of the soul floats in the cosmic ocean, beholding both its body and the ocean as manifestations of the same spirit. The word Paramahansa signifies one who is awakened in all realms. So this swan is a very important symbol in the Hindu tradition, in the Vedic teachings. But I think we can even get farther with this if we know that there is one swan in particular that is very significant, and that is Kalahansa which is the swan of time and space. Kalahansa, the dark swan of everlasting duration, which manifests as the white swan of eternity and time. So Blavatsky goes on to say, the first cause had no name in the beginnings. Later it was pictured in the fancy of the thinkers as an ever invisible mysterious bird that dropped an egg into chaos, which egg becomes the universe. Hence, Brahm was called Kalahansa, the swan in space and time. He became the swan of eternity, who lays at the beginning of each Maha Mahanvantra a golden egg. And that long Sanskrit word, Maha Mahanvantra, means the great cycle of the creation of the universe. So what she's referring to is, apart from the Rig Veda, this is uh, that section in the Chandyoga Upanishad. The universe was at first non-existent, being without names and forms. Slowly it manifested itself as a shoot comes out of a seed. It turned into an egg, the egg leg for a time of a year. The egg broke open, the two halves were one of silver, the other of gold. The silver one became this earth, the gold one the sky. The thick membrane of the white, the mountains, the thin membrane of the yoke, the mist with the clouds, the small veins, the rivers, the fluid, the sea. And in her uh, personal notes to her own students, Blavatsky makes this comment about Kalahansa. Kalahansa has, has a dual meaning. Exoterically, it is the Brahma who is the swan, the great bird, the vehicle in which darkness itself Darkness manifests itself to human comprehension as light and this universe. But esoterically, it is the darkness itself, the unknowable absolute, which is the source. So I think we can think of this swan series and the one that follows it, which is called the dove, as, a, as off Clinton working out a cosmological structure. And she's starting with this idea that she's uh, encountered in the secret doctrine, which has these roots to the Vedic tradition. And she's basically working it out visually through this whole series. Okay, so I want to conclude this conversation by talking about why I think Homo Offlund is important now. The first thing I want to go back to is this original uh, entry from 1906, right? This is uh, what she's claiming is she's getting this message from her spirit guides. Uh, they were right. A hundred and ten years later, whatever we think about this encounter, whatever we think about the idea of spirit guides, whatever we think about the metaphysical, the spiritual, this entry is correct. This indeed was the major task of her life, and it would turn out to be the greatest work. 
So I really like this quote from Tracy Bashkoff. She was the curator of the Guggenheim exhibition. And so she tries to frame, like, how do we think about off Clint right now? And she says, how do we look at her work as a modernist whose impact is most urgently felt in contemporary art? It forces us to think more openly and inclusively than before because we can't explain her otherwise. So um, I would like to read kind of my summation of why I think this is important for us now. Towards the end of her life, Lovatsky piled and published a small book called Gems from the East. This book contained aphorisms and axioms, think truisms or established propositions, one for each day of the year. The axiom for June 19th reads, spirituality is not what we understand by the words virtue and goodness. It is the power of perceiving formless spiritual essences. Uh, to most of you, I would imagine the arts today is all about incomprehensible sums of money paid at auction, museums made for selfies, or as a forum to protest the excesses of the 1%. Some of you also know, and others maybe not, that as early as the decade before Ofklund's death, there has been a persistent effort, almost a pitched battle, to diminish and completely marginalize the spiritual interests and concerns of artists in the European and American traditions. Uh, perhaps there is a connection between the second situation and the first one. Uh, the spiritual was acceptable for those, quote, uh, primitive cultures, unquote, but it was framed as immature and at best delusional and at worst pathological. Something for those pe other people over there, but not for us. At the highest levels, great energy was spent on this effort. Countless exhibitions, books, scholarly papers, dissertations, and dialogues were summoned to this fight, all in order to find some other rationale, some other motivation than the spiritual and art. This effort was so successful that even as early as 1945, at the dawning of the New York School and one year after Othklin's death, a young Barnett Newman could write, the present feeling seems to be that the artist's concern with form, color, and spatial arrangement this subjective approach to art reduces it to a kind of ornament. It is a decorative art built on slogans of purism where the attempt is made for an unworldly statement. Now to be fair, this desire to diminish the spiritual wasn't completely illegitimate. I'm not saying that we should abandon all other understandings and uncritically embrace a so-called spiritual interpretation. But in the zealousness of this effort to suppress the spiritual, this entire realm, a realm that is arguably greater and vaster than the material, was obfuscated and then written out of existence in the arts. Instead, generations of artists have been educated and worked in a materialist orientation, first as modernists, later as postmodernists, and today as contemporary artists, uh, all of us working and later critiquing this monolithic and amnesiatic understanding. But in this fact is revealed the importance of Hilma Ofklint today. It is impossible to marginalize her spiritual orientation. It cannot be removed from understanding her work or her motivations. It is too present, too persistent, and too overarching. To try and do so is to admit the weakness of this attempt to marginalize it and reveal that these criticisms were at best straw men built on ignorance and personal bias. It was never descriptive of what the artists themselves were actually thinking, discussing, and doing. However, it is not enough that we should study and appreciate her works in isolation, but that we should also consider her path. The importance of off Clint in the now calls us to return to the source. It calls us to reconsider our motivations and our reasons. What drives us as individuals, and what do we think will come of it? Consider that Ofklint walks away from the successes of her youth. She is first of a generation of women academic artists. She is a star student with a promising career and institutional support. Yet she leaves all of this behind. She leaves the art world and its systems of galleries, institutions, and patronage for something that she herself never completely understands. Instead, propelled by conviction and belief, she walks the small and narrow path and in the tradition of her forefathers, sails into the unknown. Thank you.
So I just want to add one tiny postscript to this. While I was in the process of doing of uh, researching this particular um, slide deck here, I came across this article in the Hindu, which is a uh, newspaper that's been published in um, in Chennai, which is the same location as the Theosophical Society's headquarters in India uh, since 1878. And check out that title: Hilmar Klint, the Tantric Artist in Sweden. So there's that word tantra, right? Uh, in Sanskrit, it means like loom or weave or a system, right? In the term tantra in the Indian traditions also means any system broadly applicable, a text, a theory, a system, a method, an instrument, a technique, or a practice. Now, some of you might know this book that came out uh, about 19, uh, sorry, 2011. Uh, this was compiled by the poet uh, Franck Andre Jam, and basically he claims that through this process he uh, traveled extensively in Rajasthan and met these uh, tantric practitioners, and they had these uh, um, pieces of artwork that they used for meditative processes, and that these artwork were cause descriptions of cosmological processes, and this is what they look like. And these are all from the 1600s, is what he says. Right? So this is really interesting to me because it points to the possibility that uh, off Clint and the idea of abstraction is that she is actually part of a very old and long tradition. It's just that the, it's, it, its roots are outside of the West, and outside of our culture. Okay, thank you. I want to thank especially Julia Kim uh, from the LACMA, uh, the librarians of the uh, Henry S. Alcott Memorial Library, and especially Dr. Salyer, where is he, and uh, the entire staff of the PRS. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>